Good morning, everyone. It's Sunday, July 19, 2015. We welcome you all to our roundtable. The subject today is life and the golden text, Psalm. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So um, I'd like comments on, on the golden text, also the responsive reading. I know some of you wrote very well on the forum about it. What does it mean for God to be the strength of your life? I looked that up uh, in the 1828 dictionary. I just love that dictionary. And um, one of the definitions was spirit with a capital S. Uh, animation, natural force, and another was power of mind, uh, intellectual force, um, power of any faculty, strength of um, of reason, of judgment. I just thought they were so beautiful, and it just shows that God is everything to us, everything. And without Him, we are nothing. Thank you. It goes into every aspect of your being. So if you ever feel like you're failing in any way, whether your strength is failing, your eyesight, your enthusiasm, your energy, go back to this. God is the strength of your life. It's not in matter. Bring that out very clearly in the lesson. It is in God. And then, whom shall you be afraid? The answer to fear, and if any of you are listening and still have fears, you you face those fears. You get to the bottom of it. As, as I've said, you write them down. Write down what you're afraid of, and then write down the antidote. What does God say about it? We shouldn't walk this earth in fear. Not if we're calling ourselves a Christian scientist. And I once did, so I know what it means to, to get out of that. Anybody else? Thank you very much, Janet. I, I want you, again, we're going to talk about the word weight, and you can use your definitions in a moment. Anybody else? Oh, and when you think about it on an even grander scale, there, there is a power that created the universe, that created us, that takes care of the, everything in the universe, including us. I mean, there is a power. We call that power God. Mrs. Eddy has helped us to understand a little bit of what that power is. You know, it's divine mind. It's spirit. It's, it's, it's certainly not matter. That power is, that's the power behind everything in the universe, including us. It's our creator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not only the strength of our lives, it is our life, as was said earlier. So this is, you know, this is no personal, small personal thing. This is it. This is everything. It's a pretty grand picture, I would say. The grand picture. And to wake up every morning knowing God is life, God is my life, God is the only pure and perfect life. Your life is not in matter. As you de keep declaring for it, you will find out things of the senses, the things of this world become less and less. God becomes more and more. You know, on our carousel, we have wonderful articles. Jeremy changes them regularly. And uh, any of you have found some, Sharon has been great in finding wonderful articles. Um, we have our watching point, too. Every week, Linda changes it. And so, Linda, what is the watching point this week? Because it, it goes directly with the lesson. It's watch 168. 
watch lest you attempt to put spiritual power into operation without at the same time purifying your motive for using it, working to purge it of mortal mind limitation and finite desire. Six days shalt thou labor with the mesmerism of mortal belief to destroy it, but then must come the Sabbath, where one opens his thought to God for that refreshment that restores him for the warfare. It is not enough for us declare, to declare that God is our strength. We must go to him to be wound up regularly, as a mechanical toy must be when it is run down. The Sabbath day is a symbol of turning to God for strength and life and resting in him. It is the sharpening of one's spiritual tools so that one may go forth and use them for six days. It is also symbolic of retreating into soul in order that one may purify his motives and purge them in of fight, of, uh, I'm sorry, and purge them of finite, finiteness and materiality. That Thank was you. it. Yeah. So it's more than just declaring God, God is your strength. I love that illustration going like a mechanical toy that needs to be wound up. <laughs> Especially when we're feeling that we're we're losing it, you you go to God. You tap into this. As Gary was saying this tremendous source of power. Tap into it. Refresh yourself. Um, Martha Wilcox talks about stress as being, uh, you know, selfless apart from God, a very bad thing. So when you're stressed out, it's because you think you're doing it, instead of knowing it is God that does it. And I love in the lesson where Mrs. Eddy says, you must receive the divine principle and the understanding and live it in daily life. And unless we do so, we can no more demonstrate science than we can teach and illustrate geometry by calling a curve a straight line or a straight line a sphere. Receive, that word, to embrace, to allow, to welcome, to entertain as a guest. You have to receive it, and then you have to live it. And if you don't do that, you can't demonstrate it. I mean, it's pretty clear. That's why there's this no waving of a magic wand. And even if you uh, have a little bit of receptivity, as tiny as a grain of mustard seed, the truth will find its way into your being and will do glorious things. But if you're shut up tight and you've got all your walls up, don't complain that nothing's happening. <laughs> Got to be willing to receive it and then to live it. Live it. Not just talk about it or read about it, but have the courage to live it. Otherwise, you cannot demonstrate. What's the danger of talking about Christian science? You talk about things that you haven't proven. Being kind of being over, and then it puts a stone on people's heart because it isn't. Yes. Right. There's two dangers. One, you, you, the danger is that you you uh, deceive yourself, thinking that you actually understand something when you don't. And the other danger is you turn people off. And and even yeah put a stone again on their heart. You know, someone <laughs> said recently about someone who, well, felt they acted like they knew it all. They knew everything. And uh, and it made them feel like they didn't know anything. We must be careful in our testimonies. That person is no longer here. But in our testimonies and everything that we say and do, that we don't give off this conceited sense that we know it all and and uh, you don't. Nothing better than a humble heart that's grateful. I think what Gary was saying about uh, talking so much about it is so true because you, you've read this, you've read this, and it makes you feel really that you do, you do know and you question, why am I not demonstrating? Because I know all these things. But is the actual living, like Mary just said, living of it. There's a, a thank you, Florence, an expression of self-mesmerism, and that's 
part of it where you can talk it and you get mesmerized by your own talk. Think you're far above and beyond where you really are. And that is why in the lesson and in the Bible it says, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you. I think Chardell wrote about that on the forum. And did you too, Florence? Someone else did. But this is why we have our examining periods. Prove it. If you've proven it, then you can speak well when you've proven it. And when you've proven it, you will also speak with great love and compassion and not out of conceit and uh, bragging. go back to the carousel, you know, I was looking at it this morning, and really, if you can, all of you should be certainly our watching point. We should all be working with that during the week. And uh, and then the other, you know, the other articles, there's one, Big Nell Young, Overcoming the World, and he addresses this idea that there'll be an end of the world. It's been predicted forever, and it still gets predicted. There's an end to mortal mind. And every time we defeat mortal mind in our own lives and have a healing, we are um, contributing to the end of mortal mind. But there's no such thing as waiting for this end of the world thing. It was well, well expressed. And the article True Rest by, by um, Peter V. Ross, I love it. He says that, um, let God take over the night shift. <laughs> <laughs> How true. Let God take over the night shift. And then there's been this more recent one about uh, that Parthens had sent us about this woman, Anna, who felt she could communicate with animals. And it's a story about this black leopard. And it's a beautiful story, and, it, and it's, it's a YouTube video, but it tells us... Um, how you communicate. We do communicate mentally. I'm sure it explains how Daniel quieted the lions in the lion's den. Is that he said he knew that how love controlled it all. So it's a beautiful story, and it shows the universality of of the truth found everywhere in all beings. Yeah, did, did 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 any of you have a chance to look at the video or Yes. Yes, yes, it's wonderful. Yes, yes. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. well, I'd be curious what lessons you got from it. Love conquers all. Yes. And yes. the importance of your thought. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the animals don't keep a grudge or mull over things that happen. They're in the moment, and they just let it go. Mm -hmm. I think, for me, the most significant feeling is the love, love being all, love being everywhere, love being needed by everyone, everywhere. Yes. And... The, the, I was struck, too, that the humility of this Anna, you didn't feel she had this huge respect for God's creation. There wasn't any, oh, look what I can do. If she, if she ever thought, look what I can do, she'd no longer be able to do it. She approached it with extreme humility and respect and regard, and that was a magnificent animal who needed to be respected, and he, he, even the animal knew it. I think even the way she spoke brought it out, you know, so gently, with tenderness. It's, it was yes. moving. Yes. Uh, that love transformed him. Yeah. Went from this snarling beast, and, and I mean, he had a reason to be. He'd been mistreated so, to, to something wonderful, peaceful. You can see it in his eyes. You can see yeah, it in his eyes. It was beautiful. And, and the moment that Anna came, it changed. Mm -hmm. So remember, 
What are you giving off to others? Are you getting them to snarl at you? What, what, how do you hold them in thought? This is how, it's how, in the chapter on spiritualism, this is that he talks about Jesus doing this and only to heal. I mean, if there was any other reason, Anna was only doing this to heal, to help these creatures. And Mrs. Eddy says in Science and Health that God's creatures are useful, harmless, and indestructible. And I think it was in last week's lesson that even the beasts of the field shall be at peace with you. Well, if you have this peaceful thought and concept of all of God's creation, that's true. You shouldn't ever fear it or fear some animal you, or, or some being, person. And how could this woman hear the animal was thinking or saying or whatever? Like, how could she know? Hear it. I love that. He was renamed. <laughs> yes, renamed. Mind, there is one mind. Mm -hmm. oh, they say the intercommunication is from God to man, so. Yes. And she, and she, she was listening with her heart. Her ears weren't doing her any good. Mm -mm. She was listening with her heart. Good to ask ourselves. Do I listen with my heart? It says in the Bible, Jesus, or I guess Mrs. Eddie said, Jesus read thought. He knew what people were thinking around him. It, why can't we? Why shouldn't we? We should, and we can. And in many instances, we do. But again, the only reason to do it is, is healing. This, is, this isn't clairvoyance, which is something different. It's, it's knowing the need and meeting the need. And this woman, I mean, she, she quieted the animal's thoughts, spirit thoughts. She didn't pour in flood tides of... Well, I guess she did pour in flood tides of love. She sure did. She did. Yeah, I'm sure she did. She did. She had to have a very loving heart. Yeah, very, very loving heart. And I, I doubt very much, I don't know for sure, but I doubt she knew nothing about Christian science. And yet it came naturally. Yes. Came naturally. That's what we should expect for ourselves and for others, that Christian science is natural. It's the only natural thing there is. I mean, it, and isn't that what a good practitioner does? The practitioner listens with his or her heart, senses the need, and is able to meet the need. The only way to practice, because the words that you may hear may have nothing to do with the issue that needs to be taken up. Right, most, most times it doesn't. So thank you. Any anyone else on on spirit? Wasn't I'm Go ahead. sorry. Go ahead. Um I can't remember the whole story, but didn't Mrs. Eddy have that incident with her dog? Um uh, speaking to it, but not speaking through words, but telling it to get under the table because her her mother didn't want the dog in the in the house. Does anybody remember that? I'm, it's not all coming to me. Yes, I, I do. Mm -hmm. It was when she was a child. As a child. And if the dog would come, I don't know, do something, the dog would get in trouble. I think it was to come to the table for food. So she would tell it not to, mentally tell it not to, and it didn't. Uh, Mrs. Eddy knew this. Later on, she had a similar experience with one of her horses who wouldn't calm down, who was, you know, and, and her horse, uh, uh, the guy who took care of the horses was actually afraid for her because this horse wouldn't calm down. But she mentally spoke to the horse and he calmed down. 
Yeah, she specifically talked to the horse. Thank you for bringing that up, Janet. Absolutely. You're welcome. Yes, Mrs. Betty knew this. And we, we all, all of you, any of you who have had interactions with animals must know it as well. <laughs> so, good lesson. I think they feel it. They feel it. Well, they, I, 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 my dog is no longer here, but I knew, it knew when I wasn't happy with it. Just acted a certain way. And you, he, she understood. Yes. Why not? They're God's creation as well. Okay, thank you all. And, and uh, stay active on the carousel and also on the forum. I'm glad to see there's been there's been more participation on the forum, so that's good. Um, also, okay, we'll go now to the responsive reading. Um, it's, it talks about waiting on the Lord and being of good courage. It also later in the Bible, it says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They should run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So, Janet, what were your definitions of wait? Okay. Um, to, resist, to rest, I'm sorry, in expectation and patience, to look watchfully, be ready to serve, and to obey. Thank you. You're welcome. That's a very active descriptions of the word wait. So whenever you feel like you're having to wait for something, realize it's not as, as I think Suzanne, is Suzanne on today? Talking about twiddling your thumb, not sitting around twiddling your thumb. And I love that second one, to look watchfully and be ready to serve and obey. Should always be in our thoughts. Pretty appropriate, isn't it? <laughs> yes. And and Carol wrote too. What did you say, Carol, about that when you wait on the Lord? Because um, I used to just barge ahead and do whatever needed to be done. But when you wait on God, uh, it will renew your strength. You don't get tired like you used to, and you find that you can do more than you ever thought you were able. So waiting on God is a good thing. <laughs> Very much so. This is Eddie says, rushing around smartly is no proof of accomplishing much. Stately goings of mind and waiting is, is active. Waiting on the Lord, I should say, is active. Reminds me of a, of a, uh, a story about health. Mrs. Eddy was uh, going into a room to address a group of people, and uh, when she got to the door of the room, she stopped for a moment, and then she walked through the door, and afterwards, one of her students asked her why she stopped at the door before going into the room, and her answer was that she stopped to let the Christ go before her. Remember that. Whenever you're about to do anything, pause. Let, let God, the Christ, go before you. He prepares the way, putting you in that right mind. Before you join our roundtable, our services, everything we do, or you read, that's the proper sense of waiting on the Christ, acknowledging his presence and power. One of the Bible commentaries had something lovely, I thought. It said, wait at his door with prayer, wait at his foot with humility, wait at his table with service, wait by his window with expectancy. Beautiful. Thank you. Nice. Mm -hmm. So this is how you live your day uh, with unceasing prayer. No, no reason to rush around and get one job accomplished after the next. Oh, partner, have God with you. Have him go before you and prepare the way. You'll find your day much better and 
every way. What is the one thing that you should desire of the Lord? And I dwell in the house of the house. Lord. Yes, days of my life. Yes. That I will dwell in your house. Oh, the beauty of the Lord and to choir in his temple. I mean, that's, I guess, I don't know if that's more than one or maybe it's all combined into one. So when you, because I know, and I know Florence knows as a practitioner, I, I, we can get to do it. God, do this, do this, do this. This is what I want. It. I want to be healed of this. I want this to work out. I want that. Let this be your one desire. To know God better. To dwell in his house. To see his beauty, inquire in his temple, that means what you're doing here, to learn more about him. What does Christ Jesus say? Um, first seek the kingdom of heaven, his righteousness, and what? All these things shall be added unto you. Yes. Let this be your one desire. Even when you call a practitioner for help, and you can have a to-do list if you want to, but this is the one desire. You do this, everything else will come. It's actually the perfect resolution to whatever it is that comes up, because I know from my experience it's all too often, oh, i got things to do, so what am I going to do? Step out of his house and then take care of it and then step back in later? <laughs> Uh, right. The temptation's there, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever you have to do, you can still stay in his house, you better. You better stay in his house. <laughs> and isn't it nice we've been invited to be in his house and we yeah. can dwell in his house. But we take ourselves out. Belief. By, in belief, yes, by, by disobedience, willfulness. Now I'm going to skip over to Paul, the story of Paul in 2 Corinthians. Um, for though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. First of all, that word... Thorn, in the Greek, means torturing or impaling. So this is no small little thorn. And the word buffet means to go on and on or, or to reoccur. So what's he talking about here? Some of you wrote, and Florence, you did. I, I wanted you to speak to it. And others. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, I, I, it seemed to me like when I was trying to get, um, overcome this claim of anxiety all the time, and it will come up and come up and keep coming up. No matter what I did, it just kept co coming up. But looking back, it feels like it, the result of such a, a delayed healing really brought more humility, more seeking God, um, more knowing that I'm nothing and that God is all. It really is what has helped me so greatly. So he's saying, I think Paul is saying that whatever was bothering him or whatever was a thorn really says as a, it, it becomes beneficial in it in a way. It's a delayed Healing, that's the way I, I, I see it. 
Thank you. And anxiety, I mean, that can be torture, can't it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I can't describe it. <laughs> I know. But the, but the benefit, as you said, that's interesting. The benefit was that it kept him humble. And he recognized that, didn't he? And he asked three times that the Lord would heal him of it, but it did not depart from him. And what was his, what was his answer when he asked that? My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul espoused this and gloried in his infirmities and persecutions, everything that came up toward him because he had many things. I mean, he was, he was put in prison. All kinds of things happened to him. Thank you. Now, Mrs. Eddy had a very high regard for Paul. And, uh, but here's Paul talking about himself being careful not that he be exalted above measure, twice it's measured in that one verse, that he not be exalted above measure. Oh, you. He knew where his place was, which, which is what made him great. Yes, as Thomas brought out, Paul was taught by one of the greatest teachers of that time. He could have been called, and, and I'm sure originally he was an intellectual, that's probably got, it, got, got him why he was persecuting the Christians. But he was a man, a great scholar, uh, and he, he could have gone and bragged about himself in front of all these people. Said he did what? He kept humble and did the work that he had to do. Yes. Yes. And, and he spoke to them about his infirmities and how he'd had this thorn. He didn't say, I have all these degrees and I'm great. He said, I, I've, got, I've had a lot of problems that I've had to work through. That's a, that, that's a great person. And what did he say about all of his human education and teaching? He had dung. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Counted all the dung. Counted all his dung. <laughs> this, this is what made him so tremendous. But really, that's true, though, because when all these degrees and such, they don't help you when you're so anxious. <laughs> well, it didn't well, help anything. No, and he recognized that what they did was they drove him to the wrong answer regarding the Christ. They drove him to bad things instead of good things in God's sight. That's one reason he was so strong in the end in Christ is because he had experienced the, the offices. Yes. Yes. So for any of you now who have a thorn in your side, something that doesn't seem to be yielding, you answer it with this. God's grace is sufficient for you. And in your weakness, you will be made strong. The lower you go, the more flat you get on your knees and prostrate before God, well, the better it is. Because you have no strength. We have no strength as equal human beings. We've got to get to that point. So be willing to get to that point. And instead of complaining and whining about it, what did Paul do? He gloried in it. Yes, he mm -hmm. did. He did. He did. So think about this. So he took this pleasure. He said, I take pleasure. Yes. And, and he was tortured and impaled, okay? <laughs> and we're talking about he was suffering. <laughs> but okay? He, but he appreciated the need for it. And he recognized that only as he was weak was he strong. Yes. I, I have sometimes found, in many ways, those who have suffered the most, when they come out of it, have the clearest view. They do. They have a clarity about them. 
Those who have never suffered anything have little compassion. They have little, you know, they take everything off the surface. They don't have any depth or substance. Not everyone, but for the most part. Suffering suffering is, can be extremely beneficial. And I used to hate to hear that. Who <laughs> 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 wants to suffer? Nobody does. But Well, Mrs. Eddy said that about herself. I mean, she said about the what tremendous amount of suffering that she had undergone and all the trouble that she had suffered. I, I was reading in Spiritual Precepts where they're talking about her healing of human harmony. And that he, she put the people that live with her in the fire. But she said she had suffered the fire and it removed the dross. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that's why those in her home had could, if they took the teaching and didn't rebel against it and hate her for it, she said they, they could advance more than uh, 30 years in the field. This human harmony is a big one because no one wants to give that up. But actually, to me, there's, there is no such thing as human harmony. When you get to the point where you recognize that, then you're safe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it says a lot, doesn't it, about, for example, raising children. But let them experience the consequences of their actions. Don't pre- overprotect them. This is a radical conversation, I think, because this is not something you would learn in the mainstream about having to suffer. Um, that you just don't hear about that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, no one, as I said, who who wants to suffer, but it can be of such benef- benefit. And of course, I said in my testimony, I don't this this story about Paul is rarely in a lesson. I guess we've had it before, but. And as I also said in my testimony, you know, years ago when I used my problems for a reason not to do things, how could I do this because I still had, you know, I was still whatever sick or whatever with my problems. How could I do anything for God? Well, I mean, Paul sure could have said that, but he didn't. He kept on doing Era would like for you to use that as an excuse not to do anything. And that, that will really put you in the hole. And I was very, very struck by his statement in Galatians where he said that he was crucified with Christ and Christ who loved me and how far he had come from persecuting the Christians. Yes. Thank you. And of course, he never met Jesus, did he? No, he he never met him. He knew his disciples, but he knew that, yes, Jesus loves me. And he felt that love. I guess he, he... he met him spiritually. He met him, he met him, he met him spiritually, yes. On the road to Damascus. Yes. He met him spiritually. He was blinded, so it wasn't uh, even close to a face-to-face thing. Actually, that was a good thing that he was blinded there. Kind of confirms Jesus' statement, blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. Yes. Well, he certainly felt his presence, and it, it totally changed him. And so must you. So must we all feel this presence, life-changing presence. But in order for Paul to experience that and to actually go through the change, Paul had to listen with his heart. He had to have a heart. He had to have some humility to begin with, or he wouldn't have been able to be of any use. Yes, he would, he had to have something that, to receive it. You have to have that, even if it's as tiny as a grain of mustard seed, you've got to have some kind of receptivity. Otherwise, the walls still have to come down. And he had it. And even in, as we've talked about in his passion and killing the Christians, he did it because he believed it was right. 
had a wrong belief that he followed, but he was honest to it. When he learned better, he changed direction. And perhaps one of the greatest lessons to learn from Paul is that even after he, he killed a lot of people, Christians, good people, he killed them. He didn't just stay in his house and say, oh my gosh, what an idiot. How stupid. <laughs> he didn't just condemn himself for the rest of his days, which he well could have. But he went on to do what, do what was right and, and blessed so many, even, even to this very day. These lessons of Paul. I think the uh, story of Stephen Stoning also uh, impacted him because I, I believe he was there. I'm not quite sure, okay. um, but I think he was there and he witnessed it and he was sort of part of having it happen. So, but something happened to him also. I think during that um, incident. Yes, yeah. I think you're right, Florence. No, he was there. It, it said he, he was there, he saw it, and he saw Steve, um, Stephen, Stephen. Yes, pray for those who were killing him and, and asking God to forgive them. That, that changed him. I'm sure it had a huge, I think if you can imagine what that would do. To anybody with a conscience. Yeah. Which he had. That is why, remember, what is that saying? You might be the only sermon anyone ever hears. Your example. Your life. Your life. Stephen's example, what touched Paul's heart. Let your example touch others' hearts. And bring them to the Christ. One of the things that makes the teachings of Paul so effective is he comes across as, uh, you know, been there and done that. So anyone who hears it who has a heart would be attracted to it and get the benefit there. You know, Paul's writings are revered. And the other thing about him, I thought, you know, with all of this book learning, he was quick and ready to just toss it all out. Because all the exact so-called knowledge in the world doesn't, like let you feel your brother's need or open the door to God so you know the right thing and the wisdom to do at the right time. It is. These are the, and these are the lessons that the Bible teaches us if we have the ears to hear. And, and you know, with Gary, he, Gary was highly educated and, and he got pounded all the time. Because he was in the wrong mind, the human mind. He would by be, Mrs. Evans. Yeah, by Mrs. Evans. And, and by ex life experiences. Finally, one of the best things that happened to him was when he, he lost everything. Business crashed. He had to um, get on his knees and realize without God, he was dung. That's why he <laughs> liked it. So much. <laughs> it has a sublime connotation. <laughs> and even Mrs. Eddy said that she had to give up. And she, I think, she did have a fairly good education, but she had to give most of it up when she, she reached science, because science teaches all things new. Sometimes the less of any kind of education we have, the better off we are in, in receiving it because we don't have all these preconceived notions to why it's not true. So you certainly don't need a, a degree to learn science. Absolutely not. Not any human degree. So the lesson goes on um, about not suffering for, for any as a result of any labor of love, but growing stronger for it. Whatever is your duty to do, you can do without harm to yourself, as long as it is without sin. And then every year we should grow in vigor, freshness, promise, be beautiful, grander, each, each succeeding year unfolding wisdom, beauty, and holiness. Do we declare this for ourselves? Do we know this to be true? We should be knowing it every day. Expect it, do you expect yourself to be more beautiful, more wise? 
more grand? Expect it and have it. For God's sake. For not, God's sake. Not for yours, but for God's sake. Yes, not out of vanity, <laughs> but so that you can glorify him all the more by your example and your usefulness. We've got a lot of work to do, so all of you there have to live for a long, long time. <laughs> and, and live in the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now I'm going to switch to Precept, Volume 1. We might leave Crow's Works until the fall, since we have, we'll see. Every, every Sunday I, I ask God what to do, but... Okay. In Precept 1... Around pages 192 of our book, it talks about Mrs. Eddy. Uh, she said that the church had been her patient for seven years. She makes it very clear that she treated the church as one would a patient, that she had to take it up every day and work for it, and that it was her demonstration that brought out the results. If this had not been her thought when she revised and approved of Joseph Armstrong's book, The Mother Church, she would never have permitted the following statements to remain. Now, this is a quote. Every step of this time had been made through demonstration of divine science, the work of our beloved leader. Not a point could be carried without her aid, for she alone could show the way, God's way, and make it possible to do what mortal sense declared impossible. Now, this is a quote from Joseph Armstrong's book on the Mother Church, and this is a quote that Mrs. Eddy approved of. So, when in the fall of 1937, these sentences were admitted from page 77, when a new revision was published, students had a right to protest and insist that the board of directors have them reinstated in the book. Thus, we find a notice in the Christian Science Sentinel of October 9, 1937, that all copies be returned in order to have this done. Now, the nerve of the board of directors <laughs> to take that out. But back to the point of her treating her church as a patient for seven years. This is why we, my friends, do our watches. Then it says, at the end of the seven years of treating the church, Mrs. Eddy saw that the time had come when her patient should rise or fall according to its own effort. But she records for posterity that at the end of that time, she stopped treating her patient and insisted that it stand on its own basis. Then whatever happened that was not right would be not the, would be the result of its own error, and she would not be to blame since she was no longer treating the patient. It was revealed to Mrs. Eddy that the members must learn for themselves that the only success in science and the only right we have to call our domination Christian science is in direct proportion to whether we sustain it by demonstration. And if the members are too lazy to do it or too blind to perceive it, then they will indulge in mortal mind methods and thus retrograde from the sacred standard of demonstration. It is, difficult, it is a difficult lesson to learn, namely, that the most successful human progress on the part of the church is a retrograde step in science. Every such step taken, that is, the result of the human mind, will have to be retraced and taken over. This applies to the individual as well as to the, the church as a whole. There is but one way to conduct a Christian science church, which must be in all its ways to acknowledge the supremacy of the divine mind and to demonstrate this fact. Mortal mind success is divine mind failure. And this, people ask what happened to the church. The human mind came in. People were too lazy to, to take up the work, the mental work that must be done and this is our calling today for our little independent church, that we do this work and do it faithfully. And it, it applies to everything about us, church, website, all that we do. By demonstration, not by human means, but Father, what would you say? What would you have us do? It's all that matters. And then it says, she goes on to say one, one of the reasons Mrs. Eddy gave up the church as a patient after seven years was she wanted to do world work. And, it, and, he, and Carpenter says, um, because we work mentally, we can go into all the world and preach the gospel and heal the sick. We could not possibly fulfill this demand of the master physically. But when we perceive the scope of thought and the numbers of people we can reach mentally, 
we realize that it is the only way to fulfill it. But this demand is more or less of an empty statement to a man until he recognizes the communicable and universal nature of the demonstration of the divine mind. And then, the opposition of the world to Christian science is not based on what it is or what it does. It is a prejudice artificially induced by animal magnetism and must be broken down. Mrs. Eddy found this out and was seeking time to work on this important matter in order to help to break down the artificial prejudice which would keep people away from science. She knew they would come in by droves if this work was done rightly. <clears throat> this is our work. This is what we've talked about. It's an artificial prejudice. It's not the truth. And we can break it down as we keep working. So we'll work now for a good service, a good Sunday school, all in God's keeping. Amen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.